Friends, patrons, country folk, I have a dream. Wait, that's not right. If you're wondering why I gathered you all here today, I'm in a pickle. I want your help. This is a lathe cross slide screw with a worn out nut. Or so I was led to believe. I hate dramatic reenactments as much as the next guy, but here's what happened. Hey, aren't you old that, Tom? Eh, close enough. What's up? You happen to have an Acme tap for a worn out lathe nut? You dang skippy. That's exactly what I said, too. You dang skippy. You mind running it through a piece of brass for me? What are complete strangers for? I've never claimed to be an expert, but I'm 87.5% sure a nut and screw aren't supposed to work like this. And there's what the inside looks like. Most, if not all, the threads are gone, worn away. And that's sort of the whole point of using this combination of materials. Not only does the brass or the bronze have sort of a natural lubricity to it, but it wears out before more expensive parts do. And this nut looks like it should have been replaced uh, probably about 35 years ago. When something like this shows up at your door, the first thing that likely pops into your mind is stay away, it's a trap. Immediately followed by the realization that you're looking at a 5 8 10 left hand Acme thread. No sweat, walk in the park. However, cutting to the chase, this, my dear friends, is not a left-handed thread, which also means it isn't a lathe cross slide. I don't think anyway. I'm pretty sure all lathe cross slides are left-handed. Then again, I'm no lathe onomist. If you don't think the plot thickens, you haven't watched this channel enough. This, to me, looks like 5 eighths of an inch. You probably can't see that. But if I take this measurement while actually paying attention, this could also be 16 millimeters. Something is a foot, possibly even a miss. The count looks pretty close to 10 threads per inch, but check this out. This is the 10 TPI leaf on my thread gauge. No dice. This is the 3 millimeter pitch on my metric gauge. Turns out, we're dealing with metric dice. This isn't the 5 8 10 left-handed Acme thread you guys told me it was. It's an M16-3 right-handed Acme thread. And I'm starting to doubt everything I thought I knew. According to the Machinery's Handbook, in situations like this, you're supposed to give the part back and use any one or a combination of the excuses listed in Table 11B, which would work fine, but this is an old edition and it was published before machinists had any real need for YouTube content. Okay, settle down. Let's get back to screwing around. <coughs> Off the cuff, I have two ways I could do this, and this is where I need your help. Like the title says, this is a choose your own adventure. And to begin, I could either make a custom tap or single point thread this. Leave your choice down below. I'll travel through time, tally up the numbers, and come back here and continue. Type your comment now. Single point thread, good choice. Pain in the butt, but good choice. After all, I did a custom Acme tap video not all that long ago. So this mixes things up a bit. Smart thinking. Next choice, should we cut this thread on the bandsaw or on the lathe? All right, lathe it is. Let's talk about order of operations. Synchronize our watches and think through the game plan. Now, of course, we'd start with a suitable piece of stock. Take the OD to size. And clean up a face. Now, the next part may not be immediately obvious, but before I can cut an internal thread, I'll need to remove some material from the inside. I'll need to drill a hole. You could try to go right in there with the threading tool without drilling a hole. I've never tried that personally, but if you want to, I'd suggest keeping seven, maybe eight extra threading tools on hand and perhaps an extra lathe. Finally, to actually cut the threads, we'll need an appropriate threading tool which I don't have. Something that looks like this, but suited to our particular job. This particular tool is for standard 60 degree V threads. We need Acme threads in this case, so this is the wrong shape. And if that weren't enough, it's also too short. This only reaches maybe halfway down the part. So we need to make a tool with the right shape for our threads and have the reach we need to get all the way through. They could simply just buy an internal Acme threading bar, but every time I've tried, they've always wanted money. So instead, we'll make one. Just like before, there are a few options here. Perhaps the classic method is to start with a piece of high-speed steel. Spend a week at the grinder and sculpt the tool you need. It would be very similar to this one, but we'd cut an Acme profile on the front and then relieve it for the length that we need. Alternatively, to save on a lot of grinding, we could make the threading tool out of some suitable annealed tool steel. This is soft. It's a lot softer than high-speed steel. Sculpt it on a grinder, mill it, do it on the lathe. When you're done, you'd temper it and harden it back up. Finally, we could skip all the arts and crafts and try to build a composite tool. 
just building up to the features that we need and minimize the grinding. In this case, we'd need a tool shank that fits in the bore long enough to get through the part and somehow install a suitable cutting tip, something hard enough to cut the material we're working with, yet small enough that we needn't do a ton of grinding to bring it to shape. This is just a piece of 3 8 cold rolled, might actually be stainless by the looks of it, and this is a broken end mill. If we could attach these two, we're 90% of the way there. Now, I don't personally feel like grinding away a ton of high-speed steel or particularly feel like going through a hardening process. But the choice is yours, my friends. Like before, comment down below. All right, a built-up tool it is. If you're wondering why the part's gotten so dark, that's the result of a combination of the flux that I use, plus a long-guarded secret family recipe. And there's the tool geometry. I used a little zip disc to cut it to length and shaped it for my thread. In hindsight, I should have probably used the broken high-speed steel tool instead of carbide, but hopefully this works. Carbide is brittle, and I have quite a bit of stick out on this tool. Any chatter while inside the part will destroy this tool tip instantly. The fact that I'm threading in bronze might be my saving grace. Not to mention carbide is an absolute bear to grind. I used a diamond wheel, but a green silicon wheel works well too, though diamond leaves a much crisper edge. And then I just carved away some clearance on the belt grinder, so the tool actually fits in the bore with just a smidge of breathing room. If you're wondering what this little step is cut into the front, its technical name is miscalculation, sometimes called a screw up in layman's terms. I like to add one or two of those early on in the process to get it out of my system before I get to cutting the actual part. If you can't or don't want to braise a tool, this could have been held together with say a set screw in from the end. Or you could have used say a thick insert for the lathe and again just screwed it into the front. Whatever it takes to get a piece of carbide or high speed steel onto a shank. Internal threading. Now this is where a DRO on the lathe really shines. But let me turn it off for now. The stock hasn't moved since I machined it. I haven't taken it out of the chuck. It's still nice and concentric. I could just install the new tool and cut the threads. But to do that safely, we'd want to come in with a boring bar, or the threading tool itself, I guess, and cut a gutter, or a relief, into the ID that our tool can overrun into. You'd come in carefully with an appropriate tool, and effectively cut a groove on the ID. Bigger than your internal thread. Again, something that your threading tool can then run out into. After any given threading pass, we won't have a lot of space in here to back the tool away, stop the machine, and retract the tool. A small gutter, depending on your cat-like reflexes, would give a bit of breathing room, but we'd still have to be very careful. Having a digital readout makes working blind like that a heck of a lot easier. Without a DRO, you could set up an indicator or two and use this to keep track of your tool post. Clamp it to your ways or use a magnet. Heck, maybe even some sharpie marks on your ways to tell you where that tool tip is. Though once you've done this a few times, once you have that gutter in there, you'll be able to hear and feel when the threading tool is clear. Use the dial on your cross slide to move the tool away. So you clear the threads in order to reverse or stop your machine to retract the tool. In this particular case, I don't have a heck of a lot of space in there, I want to take all the precautions I can. Since I've already got enough stress in my life, I'm going to do this a little bit differently. I just so happen to have a two-year degree in hobby machining risk mitigation that I plan to take full advantage of. Instead of finishing the part like this, I'm going to cut it off so I can work clean through the board. Bear with me just one moment. I've separated the part from the stock and I've got it mounted now in a collet chuck. You don't have to use a collet chuck, maybe your three jaw chuck is better than mine, or better yet, you can put it in a four jaw. Because we broke down the original setup and we're putting the part back in the machine, we have to make sure it's concentric again. 
collet chucks are really good. This was machined already on the outside. The internal bore was concentric with that, so if my collet chuck keeps the outside concentric, or you dial it in with a four jaw, the inside should still be concentric. This is maybe a little bit overkill. I could have just threaded it in the original setup. With the part separated from the stock, the threading tool now can go all the way through. There's no additional material back here that the cutting tip could run into. I can now stop the lathe anywhere I want, back the tool away from the threads, and retract the tool. Whereas before, I would have had to been quick on my feet to stop the cutting tool inside whatever size gutter or clearance we happen to cut. I hope that makes sense. Just a little bit of extra insurance. The machine is set up for thread cutting, three millimeter pitch. The tool is on center height, oriented correctly, and nice and square to the center line. Everyone, cross your fingers. Okay, it turns out this tool won't cut unless it actually touches the material, so let me dial in some depth of cut. I'm just gonna keep doing that till I get to the finished depth. It could have been a smidge tighter. I made it by the book, and it didn't dawn on me that the actual thread could have some wear in it too. I mean, it's a little looser here in the center than it is at the ends. So maybe I couldn't have made it much tighter, but a smidge. Before I give this back, I can use an old machine rebuilder's trick. Coat this in some heavy grease and it'll feel like a perfect fit. I have one last thing to do. There was a small divot, a little spot drill in the center here. I guess some screw comes in and locks this in place. But other than that, I think it's finished. The tool seems to have held up well. I did get a little bit of chatter down in the root, down in the bottom of the threads. Perhaps it could have been a little bit sharper, or maybe I got some deflection, though I think I ran this carbide too slow. I didn't want to touch the gearbox once the machine was set up for thread cutting. My lathe is all geared, and sometimes if you're not careful, you can sort of shift the tool position a bit with respect to the thread. And now I skipped over some of the finer points of thread cutting, but if you go back to the actual thread cutting video, that's chock full of details if you're into that sort of thing. Anyway, I think that's it for now. Until next time, try to stay out of trouble, and thanks for watching.